New York City, a region of many names and a gateway to the USA. The New York City area, prior to the European colonization, was for thousands of years inhabited by the Lenape people, who spoke an Unami language, which is a subgroup of the Algonquin language. These people used the vast waterways of the area for fishing, trade, and later on even agriculture using the slash and burn method to clear land. We don't know much about their lifestyle prior to the European arrival, as they had no written language and archaeology can only go so far, but we do know that by the time of European arrival, there were around 5,000 Lenape living in about 80 settlements around the New York City area. The first of these Europeans to arrive in 1524 was an Italian explorer that was one of the survivors of the Magellan circumnavigation of the globe, Giovanni de Verrazzano. He was employed by the French government to find that pesky western passage to the Pacific and while on this voyage he stumbled upon the New York Bay area which he named New Angholm in honor of France and its king. For about the next hundred years after him the area became somewhat of a back alley fur trade secret where fur traders would occasionally show up to trade with the local natives. Then in 1609, an Englishman Henry Hudson, employed by the Dutch East India Company, sailed into the New York Bay and up the Hudson River, again in search of that western passage. He obviously didn't find it, however he did send back reports of an abundance of beavers, which were the backbone of the lucrative fur trade. The Dutch, looking to capitalize on this newfound resource, established a fur trading camp in Lower Manhattan. The area quickly proved to be strategically important, and a year later the construction of Fort Amsterdam began. The small trading camp now started to grow in size around the fort. The whole town started to be called New Amsterdam and became the most influential city in the Dutch colony of New Netherlands. New Amsterdam, just as almost every European colony in the Americas, was in constant warfare with the surrounding natives, however due to superior technology the Dutch won easily almost every encounter. It was at that same time that due to a lack of labor force in the growing city, Dutch merchants started to import African slaves which numbered almost 20% of the city's population in 1664. That same year the English conquered the area of New Netherlands including New Amsterdam, but the Dutch managed to briefly retake the city in 1674, giving it a new name for some reason, New Orange. They then proceeded to secede the entire New Netherlands to the British in favor of the more prosperous colony at the time, Suriname. Under the British, the city got renamed to New York after the Duke of York in England. New York City, now part of the prosperous British Empire, started to grow ever more rapidly, completely pushing out the Native Americans from the surrounding area. Many new British colonists started coming to the city and what emerged as a fur trading outpost started to become more of an administrative slash transshipment hub. More slaves were also brought in from Africa and the Caribbean to serve the ever-growing population, however also more slaves started to be freed, so the percentage of slave population by 1740 didn't really change, remaining at 20%. In 1754, King George II founded a King's College in New York, later renamed the Columbia University, which was one of the only nine colleges founded in the USA prior to the revolution. When the Stamp Act was started, used to tax the colonies so Britain could pay off the debts from the costly French and Indian War, American revolutionary ideas started to flow around the colonies. And even though in New York there were Sons of Liberty who fought over symbolic liberty posts with the law enforcement, the city's population overall weren't big fans of the idea of a revolution, and when the revolution started, despite the city at start being in American hands, after two quick defeats of the Continental Army, the city was captured by the British and remained the most significant loyalist stronghold for the rest of the war. The city became the military and operation center for the British activities in northern USA, which naturally prompted the city to be in the midst of an espionage battle between the loyalists and the revolutionaries. There were also a few fires of very dubious origin that were started in the city which forced many residents to live in makeshift tents or on board of anchored British vessels. These British vessels were also used as prison ships for captured revolutionaries and due to poor conditions on board, more Americans died in these ships than in the war itself. As the Revolutionary War was coming to an end, a large influx of refugees started to pour into the city. This influx was so high that in 1783 the British had to postpone the final date of withdrawal from the city just so they could accommodate all these refugees. In the end, well over 32,000 people were evacuated either back to Britain or other British controlled colonies. Post-war New York City, even though not the largest city at the time, which was Philadelphia, for a brief moment became the most significant city in the USA. In 1785, the Congress met in the city under the Articles of Confederation, and four years later the city became the first capital of the United States under the new constitution. The center point of all these new changes was the Federal Hall on Wall Street. It was where the US Congress and Supreme Court sat, it was the place where George Washington got inaugurated as president, and also was the place where the Bill of Rights was drafted and ratified. 
ratified. But in 1790, the capital was officially changed to Philadelphia and New York City's brief flirt with politics was over. Now free of politics, the city became quickly occupied by business, trade and industry. The two major changes that brought about drastic development to the city was the Commissioner's Plan of 1811, which increased the size of New York City's grid system, all while encompassing the entire Manhattan area, and the 1825 construction of the Erie Canal, connecting Midwest United States and Canada to the Atlantic trade routes. The latter of which proved to be extremely significant to the city's success as it was located in the midst of the trade between Northern USA and the rest of the world. Therefore, unsurprisingly, 10 years later, New York City surpassed Philadelphia as the most populous city in the USA, a title which it holds to this day. For the next 10 years, New York City's economy continued to grow and its aforementioned ideal location due to the Erie Canal made it a perfect hub for not just trade goods but also immigrants. Lots of immigrants coming into the US passed through New York City as it was easy for them to not just find work in the city but also travel onward to Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, etc. New York City at this point truly became the gateway to the American industrializing heartland and no other event supplanted this idea more than the Irish potato famine. Millions of people deprived of food in Ireland had to migrate to other places, oftentimes choosing New York City as the main destination. In fact, the influx of Irish immigrants to the city was so drastic that by the 1850, one quarter of the population was of Irish descent. This drastically increasing population in the city sparked the foundation of the NYPD, NYCDOE, and rise to political prominence of the Tammany Hall, but more on that later. During the 1850s, the old merchant class of the city pushed towards the creation of a central park, which was approved in 1857 and construction began the following year, however it wouldn't be fully finished to its current form until 1873. During that period, the US would undergo a huge change in the form of the American Civil War. This proved to be very problematic for the city, as half of its exports before the war was one way or another connected to a constant supply of cotton from the south. As such, the economy of the city became very strained and the continuous flow of immigrants started to cause major issues as they weren't happy about conscription almost right off of the boat. That document makes you a citizen, this one makes you a private in the Union Army. Now go fight for your country. Next! Sign here, sir. Or make your mark. All these stresses in the city culminated in the 1863 draft riots, which mostly targeted African Americans as they were seen as the problem for the city's troubles. The war eventually ended in 1865 and with that the city's economy came back on track with a new but also well established power in the city started to gain more traction. This power being the New York Stock Exchange, which in 1865 already operated from its current location on Wall Street. The organization, which would become the NYSE, can be traced to just 24 stock brokers who signed a Bottomwood Agreement, which was a first attempt at organizing securities trading in 1792. From there, the organization grew with the city, and as New York became the largest city in the USA, both by trade and population, the now renamed New York Stock Exchange overshadowed any neighboring city's attempt at securities trading, eventually becoming the primary stock exchange of the whole country. Financially and economically the city was booming, but so was the immigration to the city which did not slow down and many European immigrants continued to stay in the city giving even more power to the aforementioned Tammany Hall. Now if you never heard of Tammany Hall, it was a powerful political institution that ran or at least drastically influenced New York State and especially city for almost a century. It was a so-called Democratic Party political machine that gained most of its influence through helping immigrants assimilate into the new world, most notably the Irish, but also many others. The Tammany Hall ran countless construction projects and welfare institutions and as such it was liked by the immigrant lower class, however it was also praised by the New York City's business class as its members were known to make quick reactionary decisions to changing markets and seldom cared for much red tape. But another, maybe more important reason why the business class liked Tamani was because it was infamously bribable. And this embedded corruption within the organization combined with the Great Depression and then trying to pick a fight with the FDR eventually led to the Tamani's whole downfall by the 1950s. Going back to the 1880s, the early work on the Statue of Liberty has already started by Frédéric Auguste Barthold and supported by many organizations including the French government. The money for the project was mostly gotten by fundraising in various areas like showing the hand in Central Park or the head at the Paris World's Fair, etc. But even with all that, funds for the full projects were lacking in New York City and other cities like Philadelphia or Boston offered to pay the whole price if the statue were to be relocated to their city. New Yorkers 
workers not to be outbidded by some other city created a huge drive through the New York World newspaper and managed to raise enough funds to make sure that the statue would be inaugurated to the world in New York City in 1886. October 28th, as the dedication parade for the statue passed next to the New York Stock Exchange, traders started to throw actual ticker tape down onto the streets, beginning the now well-known practice of ticker tape parades. Going into the 20th century, NYC wasn't a city in the USA, it was THE city in the USA. First, the modern NYC we know today was created by consolidating the five well-known boroughs, the first New York City subway company emerged, many new construction projects went underway, and the city's economy was again on the rise. The boom was slightly slowed down by the outbreak of World War I, however, due to the fairly short US involvement in the Great War, the city's economy wasn't that drastically affected. After the war, going into the Roaring Twenties, the city had certain problems. The never-ending incoming immigration now combined with a large influx of internal migrants meant that New York City for a brief moment became the most populated city in the world in 1925. But with that came the countless infrastructure problems, increase in crime and poverty, etc. All these problems happening under the noses of the city's higher class enjoying record high stock prices, lavish speakeasies and parties. But the bubble had to pop someday, and so it did on 29th of October 1929, a day known as Black Tuesday, when the New York City stock market crashed. The event wasn't solely responsible for the Great Depression, but it did pave the way for its start. New York City during this time struggled just as any other city in the USA with unemployment rate being the highest in history. To combat this, many immigration restriction acts were created during this time, hoping that the slowed down immigration will help the unemployment rate of the citizens. But this turned out not to be the case and the Great Depression progressed. Surprisingly, despite all of this happening, some of the most iconic skyscrapers were built in the city during this era such as the Chrysler Building, the Empire State Building, Rockefeller Center, etc. Nonetheless, the Great Depression continued, and after the 12 long years of struggle, the World War II started. Even though the conflict itself saw many deaths, the war proved extremely valuable to the US economy, and as such, New York City was back on track, expanding and developing. This time, however, not focused around industry anymore. Many dockyards and factories were closed and replaced by the service, financial, and world trading industries. It was a time of great growth, but again, not for all. For example, Bronx Borough experienced a sharp decline in this era. During the pre-war period, Bronx housed middle to moderate income classes, however, they started to change to mostly lower class income. Poverty and violent crimes were common in the area, and the infrastructure was not on par compared to other regions, mostly due to the fact that minorities lived there. All these problems weren't exclusive to just Bronx Borough, and by the 1970s, most of the city gained a reputation as a crime-riddled relic of history. This then culminated in 1975, when New York City, the financial capital of the USA, almost had to file for bankruptcy, only to be saved by debt restructuring and federal loans. Thankfully, this low point meant that NYC had nowhere to go but up, and so it did. Struggling areas like Bronx experienced a resurgence in development and construction of new infrastructure projects, Wall Street regained most of its ground lost in the 80s crashes, and New York City overall remained the largest city slash metropolitan area in the United States. New York today is, well, New York. No, 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 you can't end a video like that. Uh, yes I can. No, you can't. A good ending has to have a concise summary of the video and a hopeful message applicable to today's city and its future. <laughs> okay then, smarty pants, you do it. Gladly. New York City started off as a humble Dutch fur trading outpost, only to grow to be one of the richest cities in the world. It saw its fair share of battles, hardships, dangers, and more, remaining strong through all of it while trading with the world and serving as a gateway to North America. When the going gets tough in New York City, the tough gets going, and therefore today, the city continues to be the country's largest financial, commercial, and information center, and it's not showing any signs of stopping in the near future. By the way, if you like this video, Video, you might want to check out a video over at my channel that talks about the similarities and differences of New York City and Los Angeles. Yeah, you should definitely go check it out. And thank you to Mr. Beat for helping me with the end of this video. No problem. For those of you who came from the Mr. Beat video, let me put you to one of my videos algorithmically picked by YouTube to be the most likely to interest you. Whether that will be the case or not, I have no idea. So anyways, please consider subscribing and supporting me on Patreon. My name was Emlazer and see you next time.